फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ welcome to the fifth session for the pediatric orthopedic fellows and in this session we are going to discuss various aspects related to non operative management of cerebral palsy children we have a long list of questions almost 20 22 questions which we are going to discuss and so uh, we will not go into a lot of controversy and whatever important points are there we have selected those questions and we will ask our faculty so the first question which i would like to ask uh, dr benjamin is related to physiotherapy uh, we discussed in the first session uh, that uh, we need to start uh, physiotherapy early but uh, suppose let's take an example like a child is uh, coming to you at the age of 5 months and we are able to make diagnosis of cerebral palsy so how early you will suggest physiotherapy the truth is that it's not often that i diagnose a child at 5 months it's usually the pediatrician who does that so they have they they take the call majority of children that i see are those who not walked so it's usually after the age of 1 year or 1 and a half years but if we do encounter a child who's coming very early yes i would i would introduce them to the physiotherapist so they get into the habit of physiotherapy and they need to be it, It needs to be reinforced that whatever physiotherapy you're doing should continue till the growth of the child is complete. Most parents tell us that this information has never been given, to them. so they expect a cure with the physiotherapy. They don't get the cure within three months and they stop. And they say nobody told us. So we need to tell them that the aim of physiotherapy, to a large extent, is to prevent contractures and complications, and that this should continue till the child is grow, growth is complete. in the early stages the children are also need to get uh, therapy in terms of trying to improve their balance and so on so whereas that is not what we concentrate on to a large extent what we are concentrating on stretching muscles to prevent contractures to the, to my mind that is the most important from the orthopedic point of view yeah uh, that's very true but like uh, do you tell all these things on day one because like they are just receiving the shock of the diagnosis and no i mean you know i have a cerebral palsy clinic so i do tell them some of the material and then i think they glean from their their peers and since i have a clinic i know that i'm going to get them back in 3 months or whatever and then i i reinforce for the what what has to be said yeah I, i may not load them with everything on the first day but i fully understand right uh, then there is a question which is not pertaining to orthopedics but that's related to physiotherapy but sometimes we also need to know about the type of physiotherapy there are various uh, options available starting from neurodevelopmental therapy boba therapy sensory integration stretching strengthening so what is the protocol which is followed at your cerebral palsy unit we we don't do the boba and things like that pito whatever but i think majority is on improving balance and stretching are the main uh, issues that are dealt with right so basically the focus is on balance and stretching and what about the strengthening yes and strengthening and strengthening, and strengthening. Yeah. okay right but you so, must realize that strengthening is a little more difficult in the very small child because the child will not know how to cooperate with that yeah exactly so probably that starts uh, the active strengthening starts usually by one and a half or two years of age before and that it's very difficult for depend, depending on the comprehensive status or, or, of the, of the child right 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 and then uh, another question which is very important uh, even everywhere like whether the parents should take their child to physiotherapy department every day or like once a week or once a month and then they carry out exercise at home because this question is important uh, for everyone because if they are spending 60 minutes at physiotherapy center coming to the physiotherapy center and then going back is another one and a half hour yeah. so and the 24 hours limit is 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 fixed we cannot expand our days beyond 24 hours 
so sometimes they have to let go something important thing for physiotherapy so what sure. is your suggestion yeah two things one is in addition to the factors that you uh, mentioned the time that's taken up imagine if they're working parents both are working and not going to work two two days a week is a loss of income as well so we need to keep that into consideration you see, the, uh, the answer to your question is very easy for me because the majority of my patients don't come from towns where there are physiotherapists. So what we do is admit the child for a, uh, a week or 10 days and teach them physiotherapy. The parents are taught to give it and they're motivated to do that. Since they're the most important stakeholders, if you can convince them that that's important, they will do it and that's been our practice. So my uh, take on it is the physiotherapist guides the parents on how to do it and we encourage the parents to do, do it at home. So that overcomes the issue of traveling, that overcomes the issue of them having to take leave. They just have to fit into their routine of when they do it in the evening or, some, or, or morning. Okay, and uh, before 15, 20 years, there was a concept uh, which was very uh, popular in our uh, part of the country where the parents were settling at a major city like Ahmedabad or Mumbai for two months, three months, four yeah. months, or sometimes six months. And yes. that leads to separation of uh, parents. The mother is staying with the child and the father is at a remote place, uh, like yeah, so I, the job. I, I, I certainly don't encourage that. Okay, right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Freeman uh, Miller is with us and uh, we will also have to understand what is the physiotherapy concept in USA. Uh, do you suggest homebound program or like you recommend them to go to physiotherapy department every day? I, my own preference, <clears throat> if, they're, if they're very young children, then we try to have the therapist come visit the house. That's the most common and say for children under age two, but then for children sort of in that in-between age two to five, we typically uh, uh, try to have local facilities that provide therapy. And it's very dependent on where you live. If you're in a very rural area, there's often just no therapy available. And then once you get to school age, we have a mix of uh, school-based therapy where the therapist comes to the school but that's not very effective uh, because they often interfere with the schooling. And my, fav my preference and one of the things that's becoming more common uh, and uh, embraced in this country is to do episodic therapy for the uh, kids who are, say, school age. Uh, meaning that maybe they do uh, three times a day therapy for 10 weeks and or six weeks in the summertime when they're not in school. And then preferably for them to go to a facility, you know, where there's uh, equipment, maybe a swimming pool, a gym, where they can uh, have equipment to work out. And also very much encourage them to be involved in sport if they are able, if that's a potential possibility. Okay. And uh, another question is like, uh, what will be your prescription of physiotherapy. I, I know that at most of the centers, the therapist would be looking after that. But if you have to suggest something, what will be the practice, uh, whether the stretching, strengthening, um, neurodevelopmental therapy, function-based therapy, goal-based therapy, what will be your uh, preference? Yeah, I, I think for the younger children, it's primarily sort of neurodevelopmental stimulation activities uh, of, uh, you know, trying to stimulate their development of new physical activities. For the children who are sort of, say, two to five preschool, but not the infant-based uh, therapy program, uh, it still continues with sort of uh, focusing on neurodevelopmental uh, reaching developmental milestones, but also this is the age where I think encouraging to teach parents range of motion stretches, uh, sort of at home. Uh, it's a, a time, I think, for a lot of parent education. And that's what I stress to the parents, what uh, my prescription always to therapists is if I'm writing a specific prescription. And then once you get to the uh, 
school-based, then it's uh, more uh, focused again on uh, uh, activities uh, of daily living, things that help the child get around, improving their ability to walk, to uh, transfer, to uh, sit better, uh, things that are functionally better, including staying with range of motion exercises. And I'm a big, big proponent of strength training, but I don't think it works well until you sort of get up to the adolescent. And uh, it, my best experience has been with teenagers, especially teenage boys who sometimes really can get into strength training. And I think it's enormously helpful. Okay, uh, the last question which I would like to ask you uh, about is the how long, because this question is time and again asked by parents, how long they should need to continue physiotherapy? The question I am asking is because we know that the motor curve, uh, they uh, become play to by seven years or at the most eight years. Yeah. So do we need to continue physiotherapy till they become adult or lifelong? Yeah, my, my answer to that is um, that you the developmental based therapy to try to stimulate them to improve their neurodevelopmental function. Uh, you know, between, by the time you're sort of five, you are reaching a, a plateau and you definitely plateau by seven or eight. So you should not expect major new function after those points. So by the parents need to sort of expect that. Then for things like stretching and strengthening and uh, mobility, and I use the approach to families that that part of therapy is like uh, uh, brushing your teeth. When you start, you know, whatever age you start teaching the children to brush their teeth, there's no age when they can stop. You know, you still need to keep brushing your teeth and uh, you need to have some kind of stretching routine, some kind of activity routine that continues. That's a lifelong habit. Uh, that's the goal. Okay, uh, Benjamin, what is your take on uh, this? Like how long they need to continue physiotherapy? I emphasize that at least the stretching should continue to skeletal maturity. And very often those who have benefited from that will continue on their own, some form of sort of exercises that they do on their own. So that's been our, our experience that uh, most of them who come to that stage tend to, to continue if they see the benefits of it. Uh, then there is one question related to stretching. Uh, I don't know the original source of that reference, but in the name of TIDU, it says that if you really want to prevent contracture developing, then you need to stretch muscles for eight hours in a day. I don't know how they came to that conclusion. Uh, what do you think about that? Is it feasible or is it practical? Yeah, Benjamin first and then prevent. I, I don't think so. I don't think you can keep on stretching for eight hours a day. It's uh, practically impossible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Freeman, what do you think? And uh, do, can you tell us about how this notion came into the uh, understanding? Well, uh, my understanding, there's two sources of this. One <clears throat> is that uh, some of this dates back sort of loosely to this uh, passion that swept across, especially in the area where I work. Um, of the Doman Delicata, uh, the uh, fact that they thought if you do motion, you uh, can re make the brain. So if you do stepping, stretching motions, you can make the brain incorporate that and then the child will start stepping. And it clearly doesn't work. But, it, but they were encouraging at that time, 20 hours a day of stretching. So you got all these volunteers in. And those patients, people noticed, uh, did not develop contractures. So there's something about the time. There's also some studies looking at splinting. So if you can keep a, a muscle stretched for eight hours, uh, then it might, the trouble is it has to be stretched in a relaxed environment. So you can't have a muscle that's stretched against a, con a, a spasm. Uh, it doesn't seem to count. But uh, I, my own feeling is 
that, uh, and what I tell parents is that if they are, for instance, for hamstring stretches, if they can wear a splint overnight, uh, that I do think it's helpful. But the trouble is with that, the patients who can tolerate the splint overnight are probably the ones who don't need it. So I'm, I'm ambivalent about, I, I certainly don't make strong recommendations because I don't think the data is very strong and it can cause so much discomfort that it disrupts sleep. So the benefit is clearly not worth the pain in that situation. And uh, something about the robotic uh, physiotherapy, there is a new concept which is coming up that you try to mimic the movement of walking and yes. that probably uh, creates an engram in the brain. Is it, is it possible, like, do you think, is it uh, working or it's just a good hypothesis to convince parents? No, I don't think so. I mean, that goes back to the same thing I was saying before, the uh, Doman Delicata theory, that uh, moving the legs can imprint the brain. And there's, there's no, absolute no theory, no basis for that as, as far as I know. And uh, now, nevertheless, I think that does provide some benefit of stretching. And... Um, you know, keeping joints mobile. I think there are other benefits to it, but I'm not sure the cost is worth the benefit myself. I, I'm, I'm not a great, great enthusiast for it, but I know equipment companies are very enthused because they're expensive pieces of equipment to sell. Okay, so now we move on to the second uh, popular treatment. Uh, Benjamin, do you use casting for stretching the muscle? Yes, yes. But in, okay. particularly in one situation, usually when you've got a spastic calf in a young yeah. child, but there's no true contracture, but there's a lot, lot of spasticity. I do you sometimes supply a below knee tone inhibition cast, which is with the ankle in neutral position, extended well distal to the toes. Keep it on for three to four weeks, take it off, then resume physiotherapy. And you do find a reduction in, in, in spasticity. But this is time bound. It doesn't last forever. It lasts for some time. So it might give you a window of opportunity to do your physio a little better without causing the child pain once you overcome that severe spasticity that the child might be having. Yeah, I do use it sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Freeman, do you use it or you don't use it? No, I don't. I, I don't think the time, I mean, uh, as Benjamin mentioned, the uh, it, the short-term effect of it to me is not worth the benefit. I mean, the uh, short-term benefit is not worth the not pain worth and suffering. It. Okay. Um, uh, in that case, Benjamin, like you have a lot of experience of that. I would like to ask more about uh, the casting. Uh, do you give it under anesthesia or without anesthesia? Oh, casting I do without anesthesia. Okay. So without anesthesia. Then what about the position of the... Um, subtalar joint, like in which position you... Yeah, so this, this is, I specified that there's no contraction, which means yeah. passively you, you should be able to move the joints in, into the normal position. Right. So the ankle can be brought neutral, the subtalar joint can be brought neutral, but when the child stands there, severe spasticity, the child is on, on tiptoes. So in such a situation, yes, sometimes, I, and, when, and the physiotherapist tells me, when we stretch, we're finding it very difficult, the child cries. So you're coming to a point where a contractor is about is imminent. And then I put a cast on for a few weeks and, you, and they tell me that it's a lot better. Yeah. And that is a short-term gain that we're going to get to facilitate the physiotherapy to, to continue. Okay. So the and aim is very clear cut. It's not a long-term goal. It's a short-term goal. It's to improve the, 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 the physiotherapy part of it, the stretching, to make it a little more com comfortable for the child and easy for the therapist. Okay, and can, you, yeah, but, and can you tell us but, about the, ah, please, please, Freeman. Oh, I, I just really want to reinforce that point that I think that's absolutely a very reasonable approach in the context of no contracture because casting is popular in some parts of the US and I see patients who are casted often by therapists or physicians who don't quite understand foot mechanics and they get terrible midfoot breaks. But uh -huh. that as explained by Benjamin, is absolutely a perfect environment for that. Okay, the only question I have is like, why don't you uh, use anesthesia? Because when we use anesthesia, that takes away the spasticity component. And then yeah. we can probably 
uh, give more uh, dorsiflexion at the ankle joint. Yeah, I, I agree. If, you see, if, if you've got a very spastic situation, you may help doing that. But the cost factor is something that sometimes guides us. So if we can get away with the cost that is put. And the other thing is, re remember that if you've got a contracture of any, any cause, not cerebral palsy necessarily, and you do serial casting, the first cast might be in 10 degrees of plantar flexion. So be it, it doesn't matter. And you'll be quite surprised the next time you if you change the cast once, you'll be able to get it to neutral. So in the situation where I can't get it to neutral, I don't bother, I put it as much as I can, making sure that the subtalar joint is in neutral so that there's no midfoot break. And the second time, it, it's much easier. Okay, so yes, exactly in that continuation, how frequently you change the cast? Seven days, if, 10 if, days, 12 days? If I, if I do need to change it, I change it once in three weeks. Again, it's because children, children are coming from a long distance. So getting them back too frequently is going to be very difficult. So I, I keep it on for three weeks, bring them back, take it off. I permit them to walk on the cuts. Yes. And uh, the other question is about like how long, like say once we are able to get adequate dorsiflexion, uh, how long you keep it? it? It's only till I find that I can now dorsiflex it beyond neutral. I, I stop the cast and, and resort to physio. Okay, now my question is like, uh, suppose uh, in the first cast, we are able to bring only to neutral. Then uh, we go for the second cast after three weeks. At that point, you are able to gain, say like uh, 10 degree of dorsiflexion or let's stay at 20 degree. Once we achieve that, do you keep it for three weeks, four weeks yeah. or six weeks? No, no, like no, no. At, at the most of three weeks, not, not more than that. So I don't do prolonged casting at all. It's clearly short-term cost. Okay, and have you come across a problem where a weakness or atrophy is a concern after prolonged casting or like say six weeks of class casting? I must say that I haven't done a very sort of well-controlled trial to show that there is or there isn't weakening. But my impression is that one of the reasons why you can get the dorsiflexion which you were not getting earlier is because the calf has been weakened a bit. See, in what all that we do, for example, if you're giving a myoneural block with Botox, you're weakening the muscle. If you're lengthening the calf, you're weakening the muscle. So, unfortunately, our strategies for overcoming the, the problems of the spastic muscle does entail weakening it to a certain extent. But we need to know that the amount of weakening should be to an extent that it's counterproductive. But yes, there may be weakness for some time, but I think that is transient and I don't think it's permanent at all. Uh, Freeman, I have a question, which is uh, more of a research question. Like we understood about the uh, microscopic changes which are taking place in the muscles, particularly cerebral palsy muscles, like the change in the ratio of muscle and the tendon, the change in the number of sarcomeres in cerebral palsy muscles. So do you think that casting can probably help us to go more towards normal or it it's takes away, away from the normal? I, I, I don't think uh, the, what we have, what we know, again, it may be stretches the muscle a little bit, makes it grow, but we don't know the data about that. Theoretically, it should be the better a better option, although to make the muscle grow, allegedly it needs to be stretched and then move and stretched again. Otherwise you have more atrophy than growth. And I think the comment that, that Benjamin made about the fact that we simply have no ideal option to deal with spastic muscle and make it normal is what we need to deal with. And I think this typical kind of casting uh, that you're defining occurs in young children. So you wouldn't be doing this in a 15 year old. You'd oh, be no. doing this more in a three, four five year old maybe. And there a little bit of weakness probably recovers quickly but the muscle still probably remains short. It's, we just simply don't know. Yes, exactly. So that was another question which I wanted to uh, understand. Uh, we say that the right age for the soft tissue procedure is between six to eight. So in that context, where do we put casting? We put casting before the age of six, which is yes. not the right age for surgery. And 
uh, we try to buy time with the casting. That is what the purpose is. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. And uh, what is your physiotherapy protocol after removing the cast? Because in my experience, I have seen that once we remove the uh, cast, many children with the cast they were walking, but as soon as we remove the cast, they stop walking. So probably cast was giving them a stability. When we take away the plaster or the cast, the muscle weakness component become uh, evident. And because of that, they are not able to walk for a few days. Have you come across such situation in your practice? Yes, yes on occasion. And these are the children who might benefit from being put into an air force soon after the cast comes off. Right, okay. And coming to the another question is uh, related to, to the length of the cast. Do you suggest above knee or below knee? If I've done a lengthening of the Achilles tendon, I put an above knee cast with the knee in extension. Everything else, it's a below knee cast. Okay, right. Uh, then uh, there is another option which is available is a stretching splint. The stretching splint is to stretch the calf muscle, particularly the gastroc part. There are splints available to stretch hamstrings. So do you use those splints in your practice? You're asking me? Yes, yeah, Benjamin first and then no, Freeman. Not, not really. I, the splints that I use, first of all, let's realize, splints can be good, but they can be bad as well. Splints, wherever possible, avoid locking a joint. A normal person made to use an a rigid AFO or a below knee cast, the energy expenditure increases by 10%. So walking with a stiff ankle is more energy inefficient. Right? So we need to understand that. No, sorry, my question is a bit different or like I'm trying to ask you differently. I'm talking of a splint, which we use it at night time to stretch the muscle. During daytime, child is, is walking, but at nighttime, we try to apply the stretching straps so that the ankle goes into dorsiflexion. So do you I, use such I, I, am, I am more in favor of avoiding night splints because uh, the comment made by Freeman was that to get a child to sleep, sometimes is very difficult. And you stick a plastic thing onto the ankle, the child just doesn't sleep. And if you look at the parents, all day they're trying to do physiotherapy and uh, manage their their day to day also chores. And then to add them, add to that, don't let the, the child sleep at night. I think it's terrible. So, you know, I, I look at myself. I I wouldn't like to wear a, a splint and, and go to sleep. So, I tend not to use splints at night. I use it in the day when they're up and about. So the splint has some specific purpose that I'm trying to fulfill. Usually to improve uh, the, the posture, the stance, the balance, or, or, or the gait pattern. And that's only relevant when the child is standing up, not when the child is sleeping. Okay. Uh, Freeman, uh, do you use night splint? Because in your book, I saw in the orthotics chapter, uh, the night splint, which you have shown to stretch knee joint, uh, particularly when the early flexion deformity is developing, and also for the ankle joint. So do you use yes, such splint? I I'm, I am personally not, not a great enthusiast for it, but I do use it some because there are some therapists that are very enthused about it. And, and I am very careful to tell parents that it has to be comfortable. It has to be in a situation that doesn't interrupt sleep. And if you do dorsiflexion splinting at the ankle, it's absolutely mandatory that you do it with the knee extended Otherwise, the child will just flex the knee and you stretch the soleus and the gastroc gets more contracted and you uh, uh, further the problem. So it's, uh, I, I, yes, I do use it some, but I'm not, uh, you know, I am very cautious about this sleep issue and whether it's working for the family. Okay. So now we move on to the another popular treatment, which is ankle foot orthosis. There are a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, a lot of lack of clarity about the ideal AFO 
or what should be the selection procedure for at the good AFO? So let's start with a very uh, basic question, which I think uh, Benjamin has partly uh, discussed in the previous uh, question. Whether you go for an articulated AFO or whether you go for a non-articulated uh, non articulated AFO. Benjamin, yeah. Wherever possible, it would be desirable to give an articulated AFO to permit the dorsiflexion that is there. I may make a, a comment here. Unfortunately, in India, we still find children being given a below knee caliper from the polio days with rigid metal uprights. Now that is inappropriate for CP. In CP, you need the, the splint to have a total contact on the limb. So I'm mentioning this because we do, I still do see children who are given metal uprights, leather shoes, which is a relic of the polio year. Okay, so you be, I, I would give thermoplastic plastic full con, contact uh, a, AFOs. Wherever possible, I'll try to give an articulated AFO. Uh, Freeman, uh, the question uh, I'm asking you again, because one of the theory is uh, that if you give a non-articulated AFO to a diplegic, the ankle goes in the dorsiflexion and it goes on stretching the soleus. And probably that leads to crouch over a period of time. Jim yeah. Gage has described this in his book, uh, the, the uh, 2010 edition book, that uh, as far as possible, avoid articulated AFO in a diplegics. Uh, do you agree with that uh, idea or you uh, say that uh, all the patients should have articulated no. AFO? No, my sort of general routine for brace prescription is for the first uh, orthotic when children are just starting to walk and they are working on their balance and they need stability and they're working on motor control. I like solid AFOs because then the focus, they can focus on hip and knee control and trunk control. Don't have to worry about foot and ankle control. Then typically for the second one, uh, and these are the young children who tend to be toe walkers. Uh, that's the sort of typical pattern. It varies some. I would order an articulated AFO because I believe it's, it is better whenever possible to have a mobile joint but to control some of the equinus. Now, as the children get older and start developing crouch, then I think it's crucial to prevent hyperdorsiflexion at the ankle. And especially the, uh, at this point, often the children with diplegia are developing plano valgus. So they're developing some of this dorsiflexion through the subtalar joint. And you cannot control that uh, dorsi, that, uh, subtalar collapse inside an articulated AFO because the hinge is too close and the foot, even if you have a very well molded foot in a severe plano valgus foot, it will just rotate through the subtalar joint instead of the ankle joint. So it's uh, in that situation, it's very important, I think, to have a solid AFO with a very strong uh, proximal strap so that it uh, provides a ground reaction force to lift up the child. And I mean, that it requires that the knee is able to extend uh, to get the benefit. Otherwise, they'll just go up on their toes. If, if I may add, uh, yeah, please. Till now, we were initially talking about an AFO to deal with the equinus complement. The minute there's a varus or a varus complement, you do need to have uh, dispense with the joint, as Freeman said. And you, don't use a leaf spring or process where the trim line is posterior to the malleolus. You need to take the trim line anterior to the malleolus if you want to control the subtalar joint. So these are little things that we need to know. You can't just say AFO and forget about it. We need to know what the finer details are. So if there's a varus or valgus, mandatorily include, I mean, make it a rigid or process. And if you want to control the subtalar joint, you need to get the, get the trimline anterior to the malleolus. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
then there is another question uh, that if we continuously use AFO, continuously means like all the time when the child is standing and walking, and we don't allow the ankle movement, the active ankle movement because of the AFO, the muscle has a tendency to become wasted or atrophic. And uh, the Freeman in his book has suggested that we need to give some winning uh, period or a break in the use. So how do you use, when do you say the child uh, Freeman about uh, you don't use AFO at this particular time and use AFO at this particular time? What is your suggestions to parents? My usual suggestions to parents is for the child to wear the AFO when they are doing a lot of long distance walking. So for an example, a child who is school age who needs an AFO, I recommend they wear this, the, the AFO when they go to school, or if they're going for a long walk, uh, long walks to the shopping mall, but that in the evenings and during uh, some weekends, they may leave the uh, orthosis off if they're not in a high walking, they're walking around the house, they're playing to give some opportunity for the muscle to also develop strength. That's, that's my usual recommendation. Okay, uh, Benjamin, do you use it uh, all throughout the day while the child is standing and walking or you also suggest so, some- Again, again, again I, I agree with the idea concept of, you know, when they go to school, wear it, when they come home, they can take a break. But if the child is not yet going to school, then of course you've got to put in, tell them sometime they need to use it for a few hours. I mean, certain number of hours at least during the day. Okay. Last week, one uh, parents they asked me a question uh, when I suggested AFO that how long we need to use this AFO. So I am sure that you uh, must have also come across a similar questions from family. That once we suggest AFO, second time we suggest AFO. So then they want to understand that uh, are we supposed to use it lifetime or it is only till we do a final bony procedure, say like at the age of uh, 14 to 16. So what is your take on that, Benjamin? I, I, I certainly don't, don't suggest that they use it for... for and in an inordinately long period of time, I would like to remove the orthosis and do something more definitive, maybe by eight to 10 years of age. Thank you for your cooperation. Yeah, what is your uh, take on that? Like, do you give it for lifetime or? or... Oh, no. What I, what I tell parents and what my goal is, is for the children for whom we're using it for soft tissue control, say for the equinus and so on, I usually tell them that if we do the soft tissue procedures, maybe plantar flexor lengthening and some hamstring lengthening at approximately you know, six to eight or nine, that then there should be a period of time that I would hope we can wean them away from the brace. And that sometimes if the foot collapses, if you develop foot deformities, plano valgus, equino or uh, severe crouch, that you might need to use the orthosis again until the sort of adolescent procedure that corrects those deformities. But that my goal is to have them be brace free. And uh, there's a few patients who need them, you know, who get used to them and need them all their life to be comfortable walking. But very much my goal is to have them weaned off by the teenage years. So in that case, it's very important that we maintain the muscle power of the calf. Otherwise, like once we, or they become addicted to AFO, it will be very difficult for us to uh, yep. withdraw the AFO. Yes, that's, that's exactly true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then uh, the two question, the first is we discuss about uh, varus and valgus. So uh, Benjamin said that we have to increase the trim line up to the malleoli so that it provides varus and valgus stability. Um, the second question I want to ask is like, what about the supramalleolar orthosis? They also provide relatively less stability compared to AFO, but what is the role of supramalleolar orthosis in the management of, uh, or UCBL uh, in the management of plano valgus foot? Remain. Uh, if it's, if it's a relatively mild deformity, 
uh, I think it's helpful sometimes. Uh, it, it, um, if you get a severe deformity, uh, it's not enough. So somewhere in between not needing a brace and having a mild deformity that provides a little better stability than just a shoe, those are useful. And I do, and I do use them. I try to, uh, one of the things that's become um, more common in the last 10 years here is where you make a, a um, SMO, a supramalleolar, uh, like a well-molded shoe that really controls the um, uh, in shoe uh, plano valgus deformity. And then you can use intermittently, uh, set that inside a shell that you can use uh, for walking long distances. So it's sort of a one, two piece, one brace that uh, can, I think, help with also preventing some of the atrophy because you can do a little more walking with some control of the plano valgus, but it doesn't work for severe deformities. Okay. Uh, May Freeman. I make a comment? Yeah, please, sir, please. Please remember that a sizable proportion of our children who come from rural India don't wear shoes normally. And so when you give them an orthosis, they then have to buy a pair of shoes. So this adds to the cost. So what I do and I continue to do is that I stick a rubber sole onto the undersurface of the A4 and they walk with that without shoes. And it works perfectly well, and we use it for years. The second thing that I want to say is another specific indication for using an orthosis is after a tendon transfer. If I'm going to do a tibialis posterior transfer or tibialis anterior transfer, I like to protect the transfer for six months. It's so that the tra transfer tendon doesn't stretch out. So that's one other specific indication for using an orthosis. And again, it's time bound, and I take it off. Okay. Uh, then, I, yeah. I think that I think the issue of shoes is something we don't often talk about. And, you know, I, I appreciate the comment about uh, the kids who don't wear shoes. We don't have that so much, but we have a lot of children who are economically disadvantaged who buy the parents typically buy very cheap shoes. But if you have an AFO, those cheap shoes don't work unless you buy huge sizes bigger than there's like a clown shoe. So the shoes become an issue for us because it's hard. They're expensive, the special shoes that fit an AFO. So it's a, something that, that we also have to pay attention to. Uh, Freeman, in your book, uh, there was a very good picture. Uh, no doubt it, uh, it was an old type uh, AFO or what Benjamin said, the polio era uh, yes. orthosis, and in which uh, when the x-ray was taken, the literal x-ray of the foot and ankle was taken, the inside the uh, shoes, the heel was up. Have you done similar x-rays with the custom molded uh, plastic AFO? No, I haven't actually. It's a good thought. What I have, what I have done though, is I often use, like in prosthetics, you use the, a little bit of um, a clay to see where you're having contact and where things are hitting. So I've used that to make sure that I document that the heel comes down in the AFO. So that's typically a trick that I do. Okay, uh, then um, Freeman, uh, your friend, Reinald Gruner from Basel, uh, yes. he has suggested that uh, when you try to give AFO, uh, that is probably uh, leads to plano valgus foot. And according to his theory, he says that it's better to keep a foot into slight, ankle into the slight plantar flexion so that it prevents the plano valgus foot developing. And then he gave a wedge shape sole underneath the AFO so that a person can, or the patient can remain upright. Have you used that in your practice? No, not very much. My, my preference is, I do think uh, if you force the foot up, and I see this with people who are being casted or overstretched by uh, therapists, you get a midfoot break or the plano valgus deformity gets worse. So my feeling is if you can't bring the foot uh, in um, 
I think there are two situations. If you have a foot with mild plano valgus in a say seven year old and you can't bring it to neutral with subtalar joint neutral, then you should lengthen the plantar flexor so that you don't force the foot into plano valgus. If you have a severe plano valgus foot, you almost always have a significant equinus contracture. And when you bring the foot to a subtalar joint neutral, you can't dorsiflex it to neutral. And there, I just sort of admit that I am not going to be able to control this long term. So I will be happy to let it collapse into a little plano valgus to get it to neutral with the understanding we're going to fix that foot later anyhow. That's my approach. And I do occasionally uh, use some heel wedges, but um, I, I haven't found them that very helpful myself. Okay, and then uh, the last question is about a child who has started developing crouch. There is no flexion deformity at the knee joint. So probably it's a lever arm disorders to begin with. Do you use flow reaction orthosis to keep uh, tibia upright so that we can prevent crouch? If, if the child is, uh, yes, I think uh, in that situation, I would start probably with just a solid AFO and a wide tibia strap. If they're, the sort of approximate rule that I use is if they're 20 or 25 kilos, you need a, uh, a little more solid, either a molded anterior uh, or a solid anterior part of the orthosis. The, if you have a child who is five, who has that situation and is starting to crouch, they're not heavy enough for the ground reaction AFO to work. So it doesn't really matter, but it's really the heavier child, if they don't have a fixed contracture and if the muscles allow them, you can get them to stand up straight. In fact, I think it works best after you've done some soft tissue balance. Yeah, that is right. Like say, we, we, we are waiting for the soft tissue balance. So do you use uh, till then, like say up to the I, 12 or 13? Yes, I try. I try. And, and, and if it's working and if it's comfortable for the child, I encourage persisting with that as long as it's working to try to get, get them. But uh, then often if they have a growth spurt, all of a sudden they don't tolerate it anymore. That's been my experience. Yes, I Benjamin, do try. Yeah, Benjamin, yeah. what is uh, in your practice, the role of flow reaction orthosis for Clouch Gate? Be before I answer that, may I just make one other comment? One of the basic things that we teach students from the word go is that an orthosis is not a device to correct a deformity, a rigid deformity that is. It is to prevent a deformity and to maintain correction once a deformity is correct. So if you've got uh, unyielding tendo Achilles and you stick it into an orthos, you're going to get a break in the metacin. So that principle must never be forgotten. Now regarding the uh, flow reaction orthosis, uh, Jim Gage and others described the beautiful rear entry orthosis. Unfortunately, in my orthotic workshop, we find it very difficult to fabricate that. Much as I was excited about it, the uh, end product, unfortunately, was, wasn't as good. And so it's never worked as well as I wanted to work. And so I haven't used it much. And I must admit, it's, it's an admission of defeat that we couldn't get our or thought us to do that uh, adequately. Okay, uh, before we move to the next uh, point, I have a last question that when we use solid ankle or the rigid ankle AFO, do we need to give a rocker underneath the sole? Because when we give rigid ankle AFO, the three ankle rockers, which the normal person has are lost. So we need to compensate those rockers. And in that case, do you give the sole, which is a rocker sole underneath the AFO? Yeah, Benjamin first, and then uh, Riven. I don't, I, I understand the rationale behind it. And particularly in adults, if you're going to do a uh, pantailer fusion, it's an indication to give a rocker. But, uh, you know, if you're trying to 
use an AFO and you immobilize the ankle and the subtra and the joint, it does make sense, but I don't use it. Okay. Freeman, what is your take on that? Yeah. Yeah, in the in the in the young child, I'm usually using a solid AFO to provide stability. So if you add a rocker on the bottom, you're defeating that concept because they're no longer flat and stable. For the older child where you're using a solid AFO like a ground reaction AFO, uh, you have to be very careful with any kind of rocker because part of the effectiveness of the ground reaction AFO is to have that long lever arm that's stiff in the front. And if you add a rollover, then it just encourages them to drop into crouch on that rollover. So I generally do not use it. I mean, there are a few specific circumstances uh, where it might be helpful, but mostly it should be avoided. When, when the indication is there for a solid AFO, it means you want a solid contact on the floor. Okay, good. So Maybe, not, yeah, please, please. One more please. comment, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, one of the things that we often find when there is a tight uh, gastrosoleus is that you get an equinus or you can get a midfoot break. The third thing that can happen is you can get a recurvatum. And a recurvatum is difficult to treat in CP. And in the situation where you've got a very spastic gastrosoleus but no contracture and the child is manifesting with the recurvatum, I use a rigid AFO in 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. Molded in 10 degrees of dosage. And that corrects the recovery. Yeah. yeah, good. So now we move to the another area, which is a supportive device. So by that, I mean a stick, elbow crutch, or a walker. So the first question, which is very basic question, but very important to understand, how do we decide the supportive device, which device we need to give? Benjamin, how do you start uh, giving that? Well, first of all, if, if the child, you know, spontaneously starts reaching out to, for the parent's hands to hold on to the walk, you know that they do need some support. And if you carefully look at the balance, whether the side to side balance and front to back balance, and if you find that they are poor in, in both uh, planes, then probably they'll end up using a walker. But if they are un unstable in just one of the planes, then they probably manage with uh, elbow crutches or off strand crutches. Okay. So, so yeah. yes, how do you take that decision? So can you describe how do you check the anteroposterior balance and side to side balance? Uh, if, if you can ask the child to stand gently, push them forward and they tend to fall forward without being able to correct themselves. Or if they're going to push them to the side, then they have the same problem. I'm not sure whether uh, closing the eyes, it makes it a realistic situation for them to go. But uh, yeah, that's very simply how I do it to see whether they, they, you know, they, they can cope with a little forward or backward uh, nudge. And if they can manage that, then they're probably stable in that, in that plane. Okay, yeah, Freeman, how do you decide the type of uh, supportive device? So, so, so generally, the children who are not independently walking by say age two, but are you know, cruising around furniture, uh, the first thing is a posterior based walker so that they uh, stand them upright. With the exception of a few children who have a lot of mental retardation, they need an anterior based walker because they don't know that something behind them is not there. Uh, and then I like, I encourage therapists to start introducing crutches if the child is still needing a walker, uh, introducing crutches at age five and having them practice and uh, train them and teach them. Uh, very few children can use crutches much before age five, but I think it's absolutely mandatory to introduce the crutches before late childhood, because if you wait till adolescence, and you say, oh, now this is a 12 year old who's walking with a walker and I want them to use crutches, which they clearly could do. Almost none of them will ever get comfortable with it. So they need to learn in that middle childhood age, they need to get comfortable. And then the other thing is there's a big sort of sense amongst parents that the ideal walking is walking without support. And uh, I spend a lot of time talking to parents about the fact that 
you know, we all in our normal lives use different types of mobility, whether we might use a bicycle to go to some place, we drive a car for something else. And for the child with a disability in the house, they may walk around just holding on to the furniture, but that doesn't work if you're out at the shopping mall or at school. So, uh, you know, you need to develop the ability to use a device and then let the child, let the adolescent more like, uh, use that device which they f find is comfortable for them in that circumstance. And that may mean a crutch, crutches or two crutches or one crutch or it's, I don't have a specific physical exam. I very much encourage the family and the child to experiment and they need to have, they need to be taught how to use crutches. You can't just, I have this experience where parents say, well, we bought crutches for him. It didn't work. Well, they have to be taught. It's, it's not an intuitive skill and the physical therapist needs to spend time teaching the use and safety of crutches. The walker is a bit more intuitive. You hold on to it and you'll walk, but crutches are not, for many of these children, so intuitive. And I think there's, there are a few people who find useful single point cane, but again, there's this sense that, oh, well, it's an, a big improvement if the child can walk with a single point cane. But, you know, I, find it it usually doesn't work if they need a cane for balance they do much better with one loft strand crutch or two depending on the environment then, uh, there is another observation that uh, many times the child with gmfcs uh, level three when you give them a walker their walking speed is much better but as soon as you reduce the support uh, like you try to ask them to walk with elbow crutches, two elbow crutches, their walking speed is reduced. So have you seen such observation in the practice and what is the reason for that? Yes, yes, because it's less support. Uh, I think it provides less support. And um, th that's one of the reasons why I think it's absolutely crucial to have this training period in childhood because uh, there are some children who will not be able to use crutches, who will need a walker long-term. But you don't quite know that until the child really has been taught and has the experience to work through this slow phase of walking and get very comfortable with the crutches. And then they will see the advantage of the crutches. I mean, crutches have a lot of advantages. They're easier to go upstairs with. They're uh, narrower to go through doorways and bathrooms. They are lighter weight to go into transportation, cars or buses. You know, there are so many advantages of crutches if they can get comfortable using them, but that, that's what takes the time. It's why I say it, it, it doesn't work if you just give them the crutches and say, use crutches. They have to have the training, they have to work on it, it, uh, and then we have to admit that some can't. And that's part of the trial and error part. Okay, uh, Benjamin, uh, I have one practical question. Many a times GMFCS level two child to whom we operate for a multi-level surgery. Once we start uh, the post-op uh, rehabilitation, we usually start with Walker. The yeah. child before surgery was walking without walker. Yeah. So now how you uh, travel or like suggest uh, the patient to like go from walker to no support. So what is your transition phases and what are the particular landmarks when you decide to go for the next level? The reason for giving uh, walker in the postoperative period is to give them a, a fairly good balanced support, particularly when there is some element of pain involved. And it is to alleviate that and to prevent that from getting worse. Once pain is resolved and the strength is improved, then I usually take them off the, off, off the walker. Uh, before I stop, let me just comment on what Freeman said. There is a notion that walking normally is walking without uh, walking aid. 
And the second thing is that parents often ask how long they need to use it. So they improved, the child was walking awfully, but you've done something and then you give them a, a pair of loft strand, loft strand crutches and they're walking well. And mom comes and says, when will my son walk without the, the crutches? And I've been fortunate that most of those moms who've asked that or the dads who've asked that wear specs. So I turned around and asked them, when is it going to be that you're going to be able to read and see my face? clearly without specs. And they say, no, no, that I've got to wear constantly till, you know, in, in. So I said, that's the same with this child's uh, limbs. So let's not think that it's a defeat. It's something that we need to have, have. So it's like a blood pressure medicine. Once you start blood pressure yes. medicine, you have to. You have to die. Uh, then uh, one big difference between uh, USA and India I've seen is like in India, most of the time we use a walker, which has a horizontal portion in the front. While in USA, most of the uh, therapists, they used to give a walker, which is uh, closed from behind and open from front. So what is the reason for that difference? Remain. So the, the walker around the back for children with cerebral palsy encourages more upright stance, not leading forward into the walker as much. That's its really its main benefit. The other benefit is that you can go up to the walker to a desk surface or a, uh, uh, say, in the bathroom, a counter surface, and then, you know, stand at the walker, then back up and you can leave with the walker. So it has that advantage as well. Uh, and as I said, I, you know, most of our children use that. Uh, there are um, the, the two groups of children for whom the posterior walker doesn't work well are those with severe mental retardation who need to see something in front of them that they're following. And it also seems to work better, I think, for blind people to have a walker in front because it's like they can feel something as they're coming up to it better. So those are the two situations where I actually encourage front-based walkers. But it's not like that their uh, forward balance is better than the posterior balance and it, it's not like no. that. No. Okay. Good. So now we move on to the another important non-operative treatment, uh, which is neuromuscular blockage. Uh, we have two options for that. The one is alcohol and second is botulinum. I request uh, Dr. Siddharth, who is from Manipal, and very few centers in India are using alcohol. And Manipal is one of that center where they are using alcohol very frequently. So Siddharth is going to give us some important highlights about the use of alcohol. Siddharth. Yes. Uh, that screen sharing has been disabled. screen sharing has been disabled. Yeah, just let me check the security enabled. Uh, share screen. Yeah, now you can check. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to start with the case scenario. You yeah. see this child presenting to our OPD with a jump uh, gait, uh, with the knee in flexion and the ankle in uh, plantar flexion. So when we evaluated the child in the clinic, we noted that the adductors were uh, relatively stretchable. The knee was also uh, stretchable and the hamstring that was there was spastic, spastic of the hamstring was more of dynamic component. And when they examined the gastrosoleus, we realized that the gastrosoleus, uh, the, it was more of a contracture, which didn't improve on flexion or extension. So both the gastrocnemius and the soleus were involved. So the popliteal angle was 20 degrees, indicating a dynamic spasticity. Right. And uh, the prone rectus test also, uh, we could make out that uh, the rectus uh, uh, When we examined the upper limb, the shoulder and the elbow was relatively uh, uh, full function was there. There was some amount of uh, restriction of supination, but that was passively correctable. So coming to the myoneural blockade, it causes temporary muscle weakening and provides a window of opportunity for effective muscle stretching for the physician. So in spastic cerebral palsy, the dynamic deformity of the adductors, the hamstrings and the gastrosoleus can be addressed 
and it provides a proper window for the stretching uh, program so such muscles which cannot be uh, stretched casted or braced can be given a trial of this alcohol injection so when it is not used it is probably a contracture or rigid deformity and in upper limb uh, involvement because of the close proximity of the neurovascular structures and which can lead to subsequent injury because of the alcohol and the chemical injury so in such cases probably uh, it's contraindicated so the two options as sir said was botulinum and alcohol we uh, notice that this alcohol uh, that is available is around 1000 times cheaper as compared to the botulinum in our hospital itself so this is the agent we probably uh, use uh, more in the lower limb for the myoneural block so based on the case which i showed we uh, made a provisional plan of a myoneural block for the hamstrings as there was a more dynamic uh, spasticity and as the gastrocoeliac was in contracture which may need surgery however all the decisions was after evaluation under anesthesia so when we examined the child under anesthesia the adductors were stretchable the hamstrings uh, there was a dynamic contract uh, dynamic spasticity whereas when we examined for the uh, popliteal angle also the dynamic spasticity was there and it was fully stretchable uh, however the gastrocoeliac that we when we examined that was more of a uh, in rigid deformity so that required a surgical release and not a myoneural block so there was no change in plan and we went ahead with the myoneural block this is the technique of giving the injection where the muscle is first palpated and then a needle is inserted we don't use any other modality to localize the muscle so we just extend uh, the joint involved for the movement as in here we are checking for the hamstring so we just extend and flex the knee on the left hand and the right hand box we can see that the needle is moving so that indicates that the needle is in the hamstring the muscle which are targeting the medial and the lateral hamstring uh, then we inject around 0.7 cc of alcohol which is 40% concentration which is prepared in our own uh, pharmacy and uh, once the injection is given uh, this uh, we also do it for the adductors and the gastrocoeliac but in this case it was not done we went with the surgical uh, management of the gastrocoeliac because of the rigid deformity so going back to the literature there is an article by carpenter in 1980 who described this alcohol as a intramuscular alcohol wash and he did it in 128 out of 130 children i noticed that the gait pattern had improved there was reduced spasticity however the most important thing he mentioned was there was no weakness and he mentioned the duration of action to be around 1 to 6 weeks and the dilution he used and he recommended was 35 to 60 percentage because a lesser dilution would behave as a local anesthetic so another article by tilton described the mechanism of action as the denaturing of proteins and tissue destruction and both the intrafusal and the extrafusal muscle fibers were affected he performed a biopsy at 6 weeks noted that it was just inflammation that was occurring and no muscle fibrosis as such and he also told the duration of action to be up to 36 weeks uh, the side effects of this alcohol injection that we have noticed is pain at the site of injection which probably goes away with the uh, so short course of analgesics and the duration of action we noticed is around 6 to 9 months so there is one more route of giving alcohol which was described in a study done on cats by tardio that was epidural uh, route but i think it depends more as he has described on the comfort level of the surgeon who is doing the procedure so once the alcohol is given we uh, place the child in a tone inhibition cast and above any tone inhibition cast with the ankle in uh, as much dorsiflexion and inversion as possible uh, and the knee in extension so this cast is placed for 6 weeks and after 6 weeks the child is st started on stretching exercises and physiotherapy so this is one such case where we see that the gastrocoeliac is spastic and after the injection of alcohol tone inhibition cast physiotherapy we see that the gait pattern has improved considerably the child is walking with the better gait pattern on the right hand side so thank you thank you if you have any question any any fellows if you have any question you can ask now we have only 20 minutes left so we will start with a few points related to botox and then in the last 5 uh, minutes we will have a presentation on stem cell fine so uh, basically let's understand botulinum is another neuromuscular blockage and let us understand the mechanism of action so this is a picture of neuromuscular junction where on the top we see a nerve fiber 
on the bottom we have a muscle fiber the skeletal muscle the blue one is the motor end plate in the nerve fibers we see a green color vesicles which contains acetylcholine so when there is a signals coming from the spinal cord comes to the nerve fiber the acetylcholine is released which passes in the neuromuscular area works on the motor end plate and that leads to contraction of the skeletal muscle now let us understand that how botulinum neurotoxin uh, works in in such particular case so what botulinum does after injecting in the muscle it works at the nerve fiber and it blocks the membrane through which the acetylcholine is passing so you can see the yellow line which does not allow the acetylcholine to pass in the gap of the neuromuscular junction so what happens the nerve signals come acetylcholine will try to go in the across the membrane into the neuromuscular junction they can't go and because there is no acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction there will be no muscle contraction so basically botulinum when injected in the affected muscles acts on the motor end plate and interferes with acetylcholine release and that causes blocking of the muscle activation so in short it causes paralysis of the muscles ultimately we have to stretch the muscles so the aim of botulinum is to facilitate the stretching and ultimately that prevents contracture so that is what the rationale behind this treatment so now i would like to ask a question to uh, freeman that we have a uh, solutions which are two types the primary solutions versus symptomatic solution to give a analogy i would give a example of a tap which is leaking now there are two options available to us one option is like we call the plumber and ask him to repair the the tap so that the water stops that's a primary solution which is a ideal solution however if that option is not available what we can do is like we can go on mopping the floor so that water which is dropping on the floor will be mopped by the mop so that's a symptomatic cure now my question is like whether the botulinum neurotoxin is a primary problem or a secondary or a symptomatic solution the reason is because as we understand that spasticity is because of loss of inhibitory controls from the higher center if we look at a normal spinal arc is always exaggerated mode its inhibitory signals coming from the higher center they reduce the tone and we have a functional or a normal tone in cerebral palsy this higher control is lost and that results into again exaggeration of the tone which we call it spasticity so now my question is is it botulinum a primary problem solver or it just a symptomatic cure by producing paralysis producing weakness it's showing its effect remember what do you think about this yeah freeman what do you think you are muted sorry i was unmuted here yeah. Yeah. so uh I think your comments related to uh, the botulinum toxin are very good. The explanation, and I think if we sort of, uh, you know, none of these solve the primary problem, as you said, they they only address temporary solution. And the real problem is that we have to ask whether the benefit is worth the damage these treatments cause. Okay, Benjamin, what do you think about like the mechanism of alcohol and botulinum? Are they no, primary no. solver solution or a symptomatic solution? Certainly not primary solutions, and I don't think that the uh, action of uh, alcohol is similar to that of or comparable to that of botulinum toxin. 
But again, I think we use it very sparingly. It's not ran, used in excess. The, at, at most, I mean, by and large, it's usually a single injection, that's it. Occasionally, there have been a very few children of whom I've given it a second time. It's not a situation in which I noticed with Botox. I've seen uh, children who've had Botox 20, 30, 40 times because the uh, physiotherapist recommended it. Uh, I still remember the child in New Zealand, the mother would come. It's three months up, I need another injection for my child. So I found that very difficult to understand. So yes, I, I think we must remember that we are not treating the primary cause. There are dark side effects now. Side effects for botulinum has also been clearly shown. So I think we should use it sparingly and be very may careful. Please, may I have your attention? Yeah. Okay. So let's we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Dr. Sharma. Nineteen ninety nine, when the botulinum was introduced to India, I had a feeling that uh, now the new era has started, and probably the orthopedic surgery would not be required in children with cerebral palsy. But that belief or that uh, expectation from the botulinum was not correct. Now the question is: Does botulinum avoid surgery? Prevent? What do you think about that? The, the, um, I think if we come to the situation which we were talking about earlier with, uh, the say, f uh, three to five year old who's got dynamic spasticity but uh, doesn't have fixed contractures, then we have options which include botulinum toxin, maybe alcohol. Some people in this country still use phenol, um, and you know, I think uh, there may be a benefit that we can have a little better response to allow better therapy and a little better function in those early years with one and at very most max two treatments. Botox is what, we, what I use uh, in that armament. Uh, but you just get very little benefit. And clearly, I think the benefit for the harm caused after more than two treatments is not worth it. Uh, there is very little role for Botox in older children. Maybe I use it some after rectus transfer, the decreased spasticity after the resected or transferred rectus in the post-op period. Uh, maybe for forearm uh, muscle transfers, you can use it so they sort of avoid the problem of pulling out the transfer. But um, Botox has, I think, gone through uh, a very positive phase, as you stated earlier, uh, to the point where now it's really getting a much, much more negative press because we see the damage that it causes with muscle fibrosis and long-term, the long-term damage is worse than the benefit. So uh, the question was about the avoiding surgery because a lot of people, they say that it helps in avoiding surgery. Do you think that is it the right way or for the right reason for giving the bottom? Well, if you think in a young child who's got a lot of dynamic spasticity and you're thinking about doing, say, a muscle lengthening in a four-year-old, then maybe you can delay the surgery. Yeah, it's basically I, for the delay, not for avoiding the surgery. It will not avoid the surgery. In fact, if you use too much Botox, it will increase the need for surgery because you have more fibrosis. And as the child grows, the muscle has less growth potential. I think there's a, you know, these, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Benjamin, these people who are giving it every three months, those are the patients who just have absolutely fibrotic muscles. And every time the child grows, they get shorter. So it increases the need for surgery in that group. Okay. So uh, coming to the limitations of botulinum, that it's a costly treatment for Indian scenario compared to the average income of Indian family. It's definitely expensive treatment. The another problem of this is like, it's a temporary problem. I usually tell uh, 
patients that if you take a ibuprofen, the effect lasts for six to eight hours. Similarly, botulinum effect lasts for six to eight weeks, but it's a temporary effect. And what happens over a period of time, the new now terminals, they sprout and they form a new neuromuscular junction. And at that point, the botulinum is not there. And so when the now signals come, the acetylcholine can pass through that and can cause muscle contraction. So at original site, still there may be an irreversible change, but at the new place, the effect is worse off. Now people can say what Benjamin said that uh, in the initial phase, people used to give 15 times, 20 times botulinum, but off late we have realized that this is really harmful to a child. And the problem of repeated injections are that they leads to antibody formation. So that increases the dose of botulinum. It leads to fibrosis in the muscle and that leads to weakness. So I would just like to quote a few studies which are really interesting study. So this paper was published in a journal of biomechanics. The changes in the contractile property of muscle after repeated injections of botulinum. They took a muscle biopsy and this was pre-injection, a normal muscle fiber. This is one month or like after the one injection, you can see that there is a minimum change in the muscle fiber quality. This is after three injections where you can see that there is a lot of interceptal or interfascicular fibrosis. And after six injections, a lot of muscle fibers are replaced with adipose tissue or with the fibrosis tissue. And that study suggests that please avoid a repeated injections of Botox. However, people continue to say that this was a rabbit study. It's not a human study. Recently, a study uh, was published in the May toxins 2022 by a Belgium group. And they showed that the reduced cross-sections muscle growth six months after the botulinum injection. And they said that the re-injection should be postponed at least beyond six months. So with that, I would like to ask a last question to uh, Freeman before we switch over to stem cell therapy. How frequently do you suggest botulinum to your patient? So my sort of rule is for the same muscle is two times. I think, uh, you know, for the second time, I have to have had a very good response for the first time. And, uh, and then I'm often trying to make it last uh, at least nine months, minimum six, nine to 12 months. So those are sort of my requirements and, and limited to, to two times. Okay, so in the whole lifetime, you will give Botox for two times in, in that particular group of muscles? In that group of muscles. Very good. Very good. And so la last point is about uh, the stem cell treatment. We all know that the stem cell treatment is not effective at this stage. But very often parents ask us that, uh, sir, my, uh, we have come across a stem cell therapy and should we go for it? So I requested a fellow from CMC Velour to give us an update summary about what is the present status of stem cell therapy for cerebral palsy children. So, Tariq, over to you. Yes, sir. Can I share the screen? Yeah, please. Am I visible? Not yet. Is it there, sir? No. No, not yet, Tariq. What I suggest is like uh, you can play uh, the presentation on your side and just go on telling us about the important points. We will just listen to you without your slides. Please continue. Uh, so so stem cells are uh, cells which have uh, capacity of self renewal and differentiation into multiple tissues. There are various types like totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent. 
the problem with pluripotent is that they have ethical concerns uh, and uh, there are concerns leading to the tumor formation. So what we are left with is multipotent like adult stem cells. Uh, they were first used in 1988 in the context of Fanconi's anemia. Uh, the therapeutic purpose in cerebral palsy is uh, related to the fact that, as we all know, CNS damage is non-progressive. And it is regionally restricted damage limited to few cell types. So by utilizing anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, and anti-apoptotic functions of stem cells, uh, we can achieve the neuroprotective properties. There are various types of stem cells like uh, fetal stem cells, embryonic stem cells. Then there are umbilical cord blood can be used. Amnionic stem cells can be used. So uh, mostly in our studies, human umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells and bone marrow mononuclear cells have been used. The human umbilical cord mesenchymal cells are attractive because it is easily accessible. They have low immunogenicity and they have immunosuppressive potential. Regarding the modes of delivery, we can uh, give stem cells by intravenous, which is safe and non-invasive, but there is risk of migration to other organs. Uh, then we have intra-arterial, where there is danger of embolism or ischemia. Intra-thecal, which can be given by lumbar puncture, uh, which is minimally invasive, but there is the issue of crossing the blood brain barrier, whether the stem cell is able to cross the blood brain barrier. Then we have intracranial, where we uh, do invasive uh, stereotactic surgeries. Recently, uh, there are studies related to intraperitoneal, subcutaneous, and intranasal administration. Dosage is a significant factor in success of treatment. Dose should be adequate to reach the site of action. Dosage varies with the type of cell and route of administration. However, a large dose may cause a high risk of mortality by causing pulmonary embolization through intravenous uh, route. There are certain adverse events related to stem cells like fever, nausea, vomiting, pain at the site of injection, anesthesia-related adverse events. There are tiny hemorrhages during stereotactic surgery, and there are scissors noted. Uh, stem cells have been used in combination with other types of stem cells. Uh, there are uh, studies uh, combining stem cells with neurotropic factors like erythropoietin and granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which, which are proved to have neuroprotective action. Stem cells have been used in combination with other mortalities like hypothermia and rehabilitation across various studies. Uh, treatment efficacy is assessed by clinically by GMFCS scoring or by gross motor function measure or uh, the spasticity can be measured by modified Ashworth score. We have taken MRIs, EEGs, PET and SPECT scans uh, postoperatively to see the effect in various clinical trials. However, in a systematic review with meta-analysis by Novak et al. in 2016, he demonstrated that stem cell intervention for CP has a small but significant short-term impact on gross motor skills. However, stem cell intervention is not a cure, but has a larger treatment effect than rehabilitation alone. Rehabilitation, pharmacology, and orthopedic surgery are the current standards of care. There is an acceptable risk-benefit ratio in view of low rates of serious adverse events in these trials. Systematic review by and meta-analysis in 2019 by Egenberger. They had eight RCTs. They included five for uh, their study. They found that mesenchymal stem cells are the ideal candidates to modulate gross motor function in cerebral palsy. They, they also showed that there's a significant positive effect on gross motor function, although magnitude of improvement is limited. Uh, high quality RCTs are still lacking here. So the lacuna in literature is there is a very short follow-up. There are differing doses, different sources and administration routes among clinical trials. There's a limited data on older CP patients and there is a heterogeneity in efficacy assessment methods. So the implications for research are high quality design of studies, sensitive measures, a large sample size, young and more homogeneous population. There should be improvements in efficacy assessment methods, both clinical and imaging. Future directions, uh, we are yet to identify the best cell population. The biology of stem cells is still not known completely. 
the, how the cell differentiates the uh, the mechanism of action of stem cells dosage and their side effects are yet to be known completely there is no optimal method of administration yet to conclude stem cell therapy is unlikely to provide a one stop magic bullet to alleviate all clinical symptoms however it's likely to result in small incremental improvements in function that in turn can lead to noticeable improvement in quality of life at present it's not known for how long the beneficial effects of therapy will last and if multiple transplantations of stem cells will be required thank you yeah thank you tarik for a wonderful analysis and the review of the current status or the present status of stem cell uh, i would like to uh, ask benjamin uh, the last question in your practice of 30 40 years how you have seen the non operative treatment as evolved over a period of time i beg your pardon the role how the non operative treatment evolved over a period of time in three decades of your practice yeah well uh, the, one of the things that has remained as uh, was there in 30 years ago and is still there is is the basic physiotherapy and that i think is going to remain with us for good the onset of uh, botulinum toxin as you said was a big issue and it is waned i always say when some excitement takes place wait till the dust settles and the dust has settled and uh, you know i never got into botulinum toxin simply because of the cost factor uh, and i have no regrets about it now but i agree again i emphasize that the we know that i i mean the alcohol that i use is very limited i do not use it widely but when it is used judiciously it is useful and it's a temporary measure so uh, the changes from other aspects have been very limited uh, the design of orthosis and normative of chain is to some extent but nothing much so to a large extent what we did 30 years ago is what we're doing now without too much of sophistication but we hope that things will change okay thank you. thank you so with this words of optimism we end this session and in the next session next week we are going to discuss about the soft tissue procedures for cerebral palsy children thank you once again for participating in this session thank you bye. goodbye